It is time for our April reading wrap up, and this will be a quick one, you guys, because I read a very modest total of four books, which was 1,454 pages, way below my usual, but I was quite busy doing life stuff, like, I don't know, maybe buying an 1870s farmhouse and starting to restore it. So <laughs> we've been a little bit busy. If you missed my announcement video, I am so excited. Go watch that announcement video. I will link to it below so you can get skinny on what sort of you know, tomfoolery I have been up to lately. But for now, let's move on to the reading wrap up. If you've never watched one of my wrap ups before, I do it like this. I do first the best of the best books, books I really enjoyed and totally recommend. I call those my buy it books. Then we move on to books that were a little more middle of the road. I call those borrow it books. And lastly, I go into the skip it books, books I thought were not worth your time or your money and that you should just go ahead and skip. I did not have any skip it books this month, which is a rare thing indeed, and I'm going to take one moment right now to just enjoy that. Okay, moment over. So we're gonna be talking about two buy it books and two borrow it books. First in my buy it books is Needful Things. I'm apparently on a Stephen King kick. Who knew? I'm reading another one right now as I record this. But I decided to finally read Needful Things after someone recommended it to me very recently. I mean, it was only like four years ago. So I mean, I'm really on track here. It may have taken me an embarrassingly long time to get to this book, but I did it, okay? And that's what matters. It was Corey at Grim Dark Dad on Instagram who recommended this to me ages and ages ago, but I don't know, I just was in a mood and it was there for audiobook and so I got it. This is a book set in Castle Rock. In a small town, a man comes along and he sets up a shop and it's got a really unique title. The shop's name is Needful Things. And no one knows what this shop is really gonna be. Some people think it'll be an antique store, like a tchotchke shop, whatever, they don't know. But they go in and they meet the proprietor and weird things, dark things start happening. And it's a very character driven sort of book as many of King's books are. It's interesting that in some of Stephen King's book, I can really see his Ray Bradbury influence, which of course he happily confesses to. Um, but I really enjoy that being a huge Ray Bradbury fan. So I just like to see how they kind of knit together. And I don't if, even know if I can put my finger on how they're similar but in books like this one, you can just feel that influence. The book itself is very enjoyable. I like the themes of good and evil and persevering through the temptations of things you need versus things you want and how things that you feel like you need are really just a want and how he explores that idea on a, you know, not in an, a physical object form, though there is that too, but in a soulful, um, existential sort of way as well where we're not really dealing with just physical objects, but um, regrets and wants within our lives as a larger whole. I think Stephen King is very talented and I did enjoy this and I do recommend it. However, I will say that sometimes, and I'm gonna, someone's gonna hate me for this, but, but I'm gonna say it anyway. I think sometimes King has a tendency to be a little bit of an overwriter. Sometimes it's completely necessary for the story and sometimes it's not. There was a little bit of that in this, but it really was not a big deal. So if you're a Stephen King fan and you haven't read it yet, go for it. And if you're a Stephen King, um, you know, you're interested, then I don't know, maybe choose a different book to get into first. But if you're looking to add to your collection, read a little bit more, just sort of what I'm doing right now, then I say go for it. Next up on my buy it list is The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. I've had this little paperback sitting on my shelves for a couple of years now. I got it for a dollar at a library, Friends of the Library sale, which it was one of the greatest things to grace a book lover's life, by the way, if you've never been to one. The thing about reading Ray Bradbury is that you either love him and you understand it and it speaks to your soul, or you read it and you're just confused and you're like, what is going on? I don't get it. So you kind of generally, I think people fall into two camps. And for me, it's definitely a love it, obsessed with it, it speaks to my soul sort of reader of Ray Bradbury. This was written before we knew what Mars was, what space was, and it, we weren't clouded with the science, which I love science, science is lovely, but it does cloud the imagination. It uh, ruins some of our own internal meanderings. Is It limits us in a way because we know the truth. And the fun part about reading this was that it was before the truth, the fact of it existed. So you could really imagine space, Mars, planets in any way that you 
really wanted to. And that's exactly what Bradbury did. It's sort of a playground of possibility and just daydreaming about what life on Mars could be. Like a lot of Bradbury books, this reads like a compilation of short stories that are kind of knitted together. Sometimes they're connected, sometimes they're not. And you just sort of roll with the flow and some of them will speak to you, some of them won't. An interesting phenomenon that happened when I was reading this book was that I had very vivid dreams about space, like really freaky dreams. That does not usually happen to me, so I'm convinced there's some sort of you know, magic woo going on with this book. I don't know. If you're going to read Ray Bradbury, then I think you should start with Fahrenheit 451 or Dandelion Wine and see how the style hits you. But I am glad that I finally read this because I've never read it before. So um, yeah, I mean, kudos to me. This is one of the classics off my list for the year. I feel like I am always trying to get people to watch Ray Bradbury interviews, and I'm going to do that again right now. There is an interview, or not really an interview, but it's Ray Bradbury at sort of a space conference, and he reads a poem he wrote about space, and it is gorgeous and lovely and wonderful, and you should go watch it after this. We'll also link to my 10 facts about Ray Bradbury video and um, a little interview by Lawrence Bridges that is phenomenal, and if you're ever sad, you should watch it because it'll cheer you up, like guarantee. Okay, enough gushing about Ray Bradbury. I get it. I get it. I'm going to tone it in and let's move on to the borrow it books now technically this is on the edge because for me it, it would be a buy it book but that's because i'm a freak and i'm weird and that is the uh, the journal of madame knight it is basically a diary of 1700s new england and a woman like a businesswoman and a little trip she was going on to settle some business deals and it is like her um, thoughts, like her diary of the people she encountered. So it's a very interesting eyewitness to history, first-hand account of um, her interpretation of the world at that time. I love stuff like this, and I get that it's not for everybody, but I just find it fascinating, and my father knows this about me, and he got this for me for my birthday this year, which was very nice. He even wrote me a little inscription on the inside, and it was just sort of a cool, weird experience to have. The language is different, it's old, it's original, the misspellings are very strange, and just the little sentence dynamics, but the way it captures society and her thoughts at the time is one of a kind, very interesting, and you just can't beat that. You just can't beat the original interpretation of history when it was occurring. You know what I'm saying? Is this too nerdy? Okay. Last on my borrow it list is My Sister's Grave by Robert Dugoni. I read The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hell by Robert Dugoni, which I loved, but he is really more of a thriller writer or a mystery writer, and that's exactly what this one is. It's about a girl whose um, sister went missing when they were teens, and so she basically became a detective and dedicated her entire life to uh, finding lost people. And uh, a clue turns up about her sister's disappearance, and so she comes back home to sort of investigate and see if she can solve this decades long, at this point, um, mystery and disappearance and personal hurt. Uh, and basically come to a conclusion about what happened to her sister that night. I really like Robert Dugoni. I think that he is a very talented writer in the sense that it's so easy to read, but it's not um, cheap, it's not uh, immature writing. It just flows very smoothly, he gets characters across very well, he's an efficient writer. Uh, a lot of great qualities to have if you are a mystery thriller writer. For me, I did not like this one as much as I thought I would in the beginning. It was still good, like don't get me wrong. I genuinely don't have any major complaints, it's just that by the end I didn't love it. I wasn't like shouting from the rooftops about it, but I still thought it was pretty good. But I would say that if you're going to read Robert Dagoni, please read Extraordinary Life of Sam Hell, which was really, really good. And I also have one more book by him called The Eighth Sister on my TBR. This is the Tracy Crosswhite series, and the next one is a whole other series. I don't know the name of it, but I'm kind of curious to see if one of these will take off for me and I'll just get like super hooked in. That's really it for this very quick April reading wrap up. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below which book you loved or hated last month. Either way, I'd love to talk to you about it. If you liked this video, give it a quick thumbs up, drop a comment below, and if you're new here and you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead, hit that subscribe button, and I will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye, guys.